Hi guys, welcome back to another episode of Ancient Historia. Today we're going to be having a look at Gog and Magog, the biblical lands or tribes or individuals mentioned in the Bible. And we're going to be trying to locate where in particular Gog might have been even up to 100, 200 years ago. So the first thing we're going to do is have a look at it on Wikipedia, just see the basic outline of the description. And then we're going to go and see the connection to real world places. So we're going to start off with the connection to British history. Then we'll move on to Alexander the Great and the possible connection to the Caucasus regions. And then finally, we'll finish with where I think it'll be, which is in East Asia. So make sure you stick around to the end if you want to find out where Gog might be, because there is some really good evidence that we're going to be going over. So let's just start with this Wikipedia page. And before I do, just say thank you to all the supporters, all the subscribers, everyone that likes and comments, but in particular, all the people that support me financially. You guys are the best. You know, the Patreon supporters, the YouTube members, people that buy me a coffee. You guys are really helping me out, honestly. Gog and Magog appear in the Bible and the Quran as individuals, tribes, or lands. In Ezekiel 38, Gog is an individual and Magog is his land. In Genesis 10, Magog is a man, an eponymous ancestor of a nation, but no Gog is mentioned. By the time of Revelation 28, Jewish tradition had long since changed Ezekiel's Gog from Magog into Gog and Magog. The Gog prophecy is meant to be fulfilled at the approach of what is called the end of days, but not necessarily the end of the world. Jewish eschatology viewed Gog and Magog as enemies to be defeated by the Messiah, which would usher in the age of the Messiah. One view within Christianity is more starkly apocalyptic, making Gog and Magog, here indicating nations rather than individuals, allies of Satan against God at the end of the millennium, as described in the book of Revelation. A legend was attached to Gog and Magog by the time of the Roman period that the gates of Alexander were erected by Alexander the Great to repel the tribe. Romanized Jewish historian Josephus knew them as the nation descended from Magog the Japhetite, as in Genesis, and explained them to be Scythians. In the hands of early and Christian writers, they became apocalyptic hordes. Throughout the Middle Ages, they were variously identified as the Vikings, Huns, Khazars, Mongols, Turanians, or other nomads, or even the ten lost tribes of Israel. The legend of Gog and Magog and the gates were also interpolated into the Alexander Romances. According to one interpretation, Goth and Magothi are the kings of the unclean nations who Alexander drove through a mountain pass and prevented from crossing his new wall. They appear in the Quran in chapter al kaf as Yajuj and Majuj primitive and immoral tribes that were separated and barriered off by Dual Karnain, he of the two horns, who is mentioned in the Quran as a great righteous ruler and conqueror. Some contemporary Muslim historians and geographers regarded the Vikings as the emergence of Gog and Magog. So what can we tell just from reading that? Everybody seems to be associated with Gog and Magog essentially come from the Tartarian regions the Scythian regions, or perhaps even further east. But it's definitely the regions that we'd know as Mongolia, Tartaria, those kind of areas. I want you to remember this, by the way, the Yajuj and Majuj, because that might be important later. Certain specifics about the language and pronunciation of Gog. Perhaps it is in fact Joj, and not Gog at all. If it's Yajuj and Majuj, perhaps it is in fact Joj which we will come back to. Also note the Goth and Magothi, because it wasn't noted in this list. The Vikings, the Huns, the Khazars, the Mongols, the Turanians, other nomads, and the ten lost tribes of Israel. Note that Goth and Magothi would obviously indicate that the Goths and the Visigoths were also included in this collection. It's also interesting to note the use of the word hordes, as I always do, because when we associate the tribes of Israel that apparently crossed into Britain, slowly but surely they made their way round the Mediterranean and moved to Britain. We've got the, the record of that. They're called the Kimaroi in Greek records. They became the Cymri, which are in Wales today, the Cymri. And when the stories of these Israelites moving through the lands get written down in the Greek archives, they get noted as being the unstoppable hordes. Perhaps that's a connection there. But 
The first thing we're going to move on to is the connection with Britain. If you haven't watched other videos on my channel, you should probably go and do so, but there is a huge connection between the tribes of Israel and the British. Gog and Magog obviously have connections to the tribes of Israel. So we're going to go and explore that connection right now. So the first thing we want to look at is Gog Magog the Giant. Gog Magog was a legendary giant in Welsh and later English mythology. According to Geoffrey of Monmouth's History Regent Britannia, the history of the kings of Britain, he was a giant inhabitant of Albion, thrown off a cliff during a wrestling match with Corinius, a companion of Brutus of Troy. Gog Magog was the last of the giants found by Brutus and his men inhabiting the land of Albion. The effigies of Gog Magog and Corinius, used in English pageantry and later instituted as guardian statues at Guildhall in London, eventually earned the familiar names of Gog and Magog. And we can see the statue here of Gog Magog, but uh, this and the Corinius were a pair of figures displayed at Guildhall, London, carved by Captain Richard Saunders. So these two statues were actually one of Gog Magog and one of Corinius, but they have now been conflated, or were conflated, as you'll see in a second, to be different, to be Gog and Magog. This story here, it talks of Corinius settled in Cornwall, which was then inhabited by giants. Brutus and his army killed most of them, but their leader, Go Magog, was kept alive for a wrestling match with Corinius. During the fight, Go Magog broke three of Corinius's ribs. Enraged, he picked Go Magog up, ran to the coast, and threw the giant from a high rock into the sea with the craggy rocks below him, tearing him to pieces. You'll see here one of the two wooden figures, which is the Corinius, displayed in Guildhall in London, and it was carved by Captain Richard Saunders in 1709 to replace earlier wicker and pasteboard effigies, which were traditionally carried in the Lord Mayor's show. They represented Gog, Magog and Corinius, but were later known as Gog and Magog. Both figures were destroyed during the London Blitz in 1940, and new figures were carved in 1953. And here's a view of what these statues look like today. Corinius has the eagle on his shield. So this is Corinius and this is Gog Magog. Or after they've become to known this is now Gog and this is Magog. Usually what can happen with that, by the way, as they've said, is it's Gog from Magog or perhaps he was just from Gog Magog. But these things kind of can get conflated. Anyway, before we move on, I think it's... Uh, it's probably good that we talk about this. So when it talked about them coming to Albion and finding that the land was once inhabited by giants, this is perhaps a mistranslation. Of course, if you want to believe that it was inhabited by giants, feel free. There is, there's a lot of mentions of giants in the archives, tall people. Perhaps it really was uh, inhabited by giants. But what people have actually attributed it down to today is something that's quite hard to research is something called the Giants, which is G-E-A-N-T-E-S, the Giantus. And they were Assyrians that came to Britain in about 1300 BC. They migrated uh, because they wanted tin, because Britain was known as the Tin Island, and they they came here and they, they built a colony to mine all the tin. One of the, the princesses came over here. She was called... Albine, which is why the name Albion was associated with Britain in the first place, supposedly. This idea that giants were here might not be correct, and it was just Assyrians. A companion of Brutus of Troy, what I was talking about earlier, after Troy fell in about 650 BC, the people there, they started, uh, they, they obviously moved, and they came to Lemnos about 150 years later, where they decided to take boats. They sailed boats from Lemnos near Greece, one of the islands of Greece, and they sailed all the way to Britain, where they settled in Britain. And with them were supposedly some of the tribes of Israel, who, were, according to them, were carrying the Ark of the Covenant. So these are all stories for a different day, but I'm just providing a little bit of background on where this all comes from. As we learnt in our articles video, our Tartaria in the news, Trojans are actually Aryans from the Scythian region that are Tartarians. We're basically looking at waves of migrations of the same people here. Carrying on with the British connection, we have the Gog Magog Hills, which are located in Cambridge. The history is obviously associated to the folklore of Gog Magog. And it says the earliest mention of the name Gog Magog for this region is found in a decree of 1574 forbidding students to visit the hills on pain of a fine. Random excavations around the hills revealed the remains of defences at Copley Hill and Cherry Hinton, not older than the Iron Age, but the sites themselves are now known already to have been occupied in the Bronze Age. 
So as you can see here, the Gog Magog has, you know, it's a very old site that's going back to the Bronze Age, which is obviously considered to be 3300 BC to 1200 BC. And there's a site here and the name has just appeared. So they don't actually know when it was named that. Book where, where Troy once stood argues that the ancient city of Troy was in fact located in the Gog Magog Downs. Now, that is an interesting theory. One possibility could be that the people that moved from Troy arrived here and named the place where they moved Troy because people like to do that don't they uh, if you want an example uh, there's a place called New York which surprisingly isn't the first York so that could be a way that Troy was set up perhaps this was new Troy that was set up here when they arrived maybe the Trojans got here had a fight with the the Gog Magogians and then named the place new Troy and we can also see if we come to this page that Gog is a slang term for a person from North Wales. Why would they do that? Why would that be a thing? And moving slightly away from Britain, we have Gok, which was archaic spelling Gog, Dutch Gog, a town in the district of Cleve in North Rhine-Westphalia, Germany. It is situated close to the border with the Netherlands. Gok is at least 750 years old. The earliest mention of Gok is in a document dated 1259. It was part of the Duchy of Cleves. Now we'll come back to this Wikipedia page by Gog Magog to have a quick look at the Alexander Gates. So the Gates of Alexander, also known as the Caspian Gates, were several mountain passes that came to be associated with Alexander the Great. In the 7th century Christian Alexander legend, the gates were supposedly transformed to a wall built by Alexander in the Caucasus to keep the apocalyptic nations of Gog and Magog. A similar narration is mentioned in Al-Kaf, which is the Quran chapter we heard mentioned before. According to the Quranic narrative, Gog and Magog were walled off by Dual Karnain, possessor of the two horns, a righteous ruler and conqueror. Now bear in mind, by the way, the possessor of the two horns can often be associated with the idea of Satan or the goat man, the Enki or goat horns, you know, as you can imagine, Loki, the two horns. But it's also associated with enlightenment. So it's very difficult to pass whether something means devil man or holy man, which is just brilliant, isn't it? They're exactly the kind of clarification that you need when you're doing this kind of research. But yes, it can mean both things. Now, obviously, it gets its name, the Caspian Gates, because of its region in the Caucasus right here. So you've got the Black Sea here and the Caspian Sea. Russian Federation, this is region of Georgia, and these were obviously Tartarian areas many years ago. If we jump over to Google Earth, you can properly see now the region that we're talking about. So here's Turkey, Greece, and Russia here, Crimea, Ukraine, Georgia, and Azerbaijan, Armenia, as you can see. And this is the Black Sea and the Caspian. So this mountain region here is supposed to be the Alexander Gates or the Caspian Gates, keeping back Gog and Magog in these lands. Now that would, it would actually match the things that they were saying about it being Goths, Huns, Khazars, etc. Because obviously Khazars come from the Khazar regions, the Huns, etc. come from these regions as well. They all migrated, the Goths migrated from this region. They all come this way from here and they go that way and they start attacking the Roman Empire according to history. So perhaps this Alexander Gates actually has some truth to it and that they were stopped from coming this way and therefore they had to start going all the way around and it protected Alexander's area. Perhaps what, that's what it means because they were forced to either go around this way or go around that way and they could no longer pass between. Maybe it wasn't that they were encircled but that's just a theory. Marco Polo was an Italian merchant explorer and writer from the Republic of Venice who travelled through Asia along the Silk Road between 1271 and 1295. His travels are recorded in The Travels of Marco Polo, a book which described to Europeans the then mysterious culture and inner workings of the Eastern world, including the wealth and great size of the Mongol Empire and China in the Wan Dynasty, giving their first comprehensive look into China, Persia, India, Japan and other Asian cities and countries. And as you can see over here, my man is actually wearing wearing a Tartarian costume. But back to his description. The reason we come here is because we do get mentions of Gog and Magog, but we're actually going to read the whole thing because it does provide some important information which is going to help us in our search. Presumably. 
Tendurk is a province which lies towards the east and contains numerous towns and villages, among which is the chief city, also called Tendurk. The king of the province is of the lineage of Prester John, George by name, and he holds the land under the Great Khan. Not that he holds anything like the whole of what Prester John possessed. It is a custom, I may tell you, that these kings of the lineage of Prester John always obtain to wife either daughters of the Great Khan or other princesses of his family. In this province is found the stone from which Azur is made. It is obtained from a kind of vein in the earth and is of very fine quality. The rule of the province is in the hand of the Christians, as I have told you, but there are also plenty of idolaters and worshippers of Mahomet. And there is also here a class of people called Argons, which has much to say in French Gosmol, or in other words, sprung from two different races, to wit, of the race of the idolaters of Tenduk and of that of the worshippers of Mahomet. They are handsomer men than the other natives of the country, and having more ability, they come to have authority, and they are also capital merchants. You must know that it was in this same capital city of Tenduk that Prester John had the seat of government when he ruled over the Tartars, and his heirs still abide there, for as I have told you, this King George is of his line. In fact, he is the sixth in descent from Prester John. Here also is what we call the country of Gog and Magog. They, however, call it Ung and Mungal, after the names of two races of people that existed in that province before the migration of the Tartars. Ung was the title of the people of the country, and Mongol a name sometimes applied to the Tartars. And when you have ridden seven days eastward through this province, you get near the provinces of Cathay. You find throughout those seven days' journey plenty of towns and villages, the inhabitants of which are Mahometans, but with a mixture also of idolaters and Nestorian Christians. I think that's enough for us reading of that, because that's all the information we needed to hear. Let's talk about it. So the first thing I want to bring your attention to is George, King George, who is in charge of this supposed land of Tenduk. The reason I want to bring your attention to that is because what does George kind of look like? And remember before when I mentioned that in Arabic, in the Quran, it was Yajuj and Majuj. They were spelt with a J and pronounced like a J. It would be Jodge, wouldn't it? Like Gog, Jodge, Majodge. So is King George actually King Gog or King George? There's a possibility there. And what we're going to do is we're going to use the fact that Marco Polo is in the region of Tenduk. We're going to use that to hopefully locate some things. We also noted that there is a class of people called Argons. So there is Tenduk, Argons, and here also is what we call the country of Gog and Magog. So around Tenduk is Gog and Magog, but it can also be called Ung and Mongol. So it brought us to a different version of Marco Polo's translations. I don't ask me why there are multiple versions, but they have different information in. So this is basically just talking about the events leading up to and the events during the fight between Genghis Khan and Un Khan, who is Prester John. Enraged at this reply, Chinggis Khan collected a very large army, at the head of which he entered the territory of Prester John, and encamping on a great plain called Tenduk, sent a message desiring him to defend himself. The latter advanced likewise to the plain with a vast army and took his position at the distance of about 10 miles from the other. In this conjuncture, Genghis Khan commanded his astrologers and magicians to declare to him which of the two armies in the approaching conflict should obtain the victory. Upon this, they took a green reed, and dividing it lengthways into two parts, they wrote upon one the name of their master, and upon the other the name of Un Khan. The reeds came out with Chinggis Khan's name came out in his favour, and upon witnessing this, the king and his band of Tartars marched with exultation to the attack of the army of Un Khan, broke through its ranks, and entirely routed it. Un Khan himself was killed, his kingdom fell to the conqueror, and Kingus Khan espoused his daughter. The next mention of Tenduk in the book is just talking about when he leaves an area called Urganor, which is part of Tangut, and he has to go northeast to Tenduk. And now we get to the bit that we saw in the other document, but this is slightly different. Tenduk, belonging to the territory of Prester John, is an eastern province in which here are many cities and castles subject to the rule of the Grand Khan. 
all the princes of that family having remained dependent since Genghis, the first emperor, subdued the country. The capital is likewise named Tenduk. The king now reigning is a descendant of Prester John and is still Prester John and named George. Like I said before, possibly George or Gog. He is both a Christian and a priest. The greater part of the inhabitants being also Christians. Like we heard before, in this province the stone of which the Azul colour is made is found in abundance. Although subject to the dominion of the Grand Khan, the king being a Christian, ha as has been said, the government of the country is in the hands of the Christians. Amongst the inhabitants, however, there are both worshippers of idols and followers of the law of Mohammed. So, as we saw before, there is likewise a class of people known by the appellation of Argon because they are produced from and a mixture of two races namely those of Tenduk, who are idolaters, and the Mohammedans. So it's actually saying here, it's, it's being a bit more clear that the Argon people are a mixture of the Tenduks, or the Tendushans, or Tendushans, and a mixture between them and the Mohammedans. The plain of Tenduk has already been mentioned as the scene of a famous battle in which the army of Ung Khan, now that's very important that we see it spelt as Ung Khan, as we're going to come to in a moment, and destroyed by Genghis Khan. Although the name is not to be found in the Jesuits map, its situation is nearly identified by Gorbals informing us that the battle was fought in the space between the rivers Chula and Kurlon, whose source is approximately about the 48th or 49th degree of latitude. It was also in this tract at the northern border of the desert that the Kaldan or chief of the Eluts was defeated by the forces of the Emperor Kanki in the year 1696. So why is Ung important? Because in our other version of Marco Polo's book we see that the country of Gog and Magog, however they call it Ung and Mongol. Ung was the title of the people of the country. And right here, Ung Khan is that king of Gog. If Gog means Ung, is Ung Gog. Considering that Prester John, who is Un Khan, is in Tenduk, and Tenduk is also, he also is what we call the country of Gog and Magog, but they call it Ung and Mongol. And Prester John, or this Prester John, who is apparently called George, or Joj, or Gog, and then there is the earlier one, the one that fights Genghis Khan, called Ung Khan. And we're going to have a look at this now. So the battle between Ung Khan was supposedly identified between Chula and Kurlan. So we don't know if that's true, but we're going to look. So it brought us to Google Earth again to have a look. This is the Chul River. And this is Kurlan, or Chula and Kurlan River. So supposedly the Tenduk Plains, or the plains at least where this battle took place, which they're calling the Plains of Tenduk, are between Kurlon and Chul. So this battle between Genghis and Ung Khan supposedly happens here, according to that document. Down here it says this name of Argon appears to be the Orgon of the Jesuits and Archon of Bell's map. The river so-called runs through the part of Tartary here described, and being joined by the Chula, their united streams fall into the Selinga. On the northwestern bank of the Orgon, we find in modern times the Urga, or station of the Grand Lama of the Mongols, in nearly the same latitude, but more towards the east by several degrees, appears also another and more considerable river named in the Jesuits map Urgon or Argun, forming the boundary between the dominions of China and Russia in that quarter, near to which is a town or city called Argonskoy. Now this is what we're going to look at. I've already took the liberty of finding as Argun, it's also spelt sometimes, as you might have seen, with the E as Ergun. It's Argun or Ergun. And along this river, you will actually find a little place called Argunsk. Now, obviously, this might be Argunskoy, which is very difficult to locate nowadays, but we do know it's a real place. If we come to this little uh, thesaurus dictionary thing, but you'll be able to find this if you Google Argunskoy, you'll be able to locate something similar. It shows you Argun right there, a river of Asia, see Sigalian. Argunskoy, a town of Siberia on the frontiers of eastern Turkey. Now that's very weird that it says on the frontiers of eastern Turkey because you'll, you'll see why, because they've edited that basically, I'll show you. It's quite fun, so I'm glad we found that actually. But Argunskoy, a town of Siberia on the frontiers of eastern Turkey, 
There are mines of silver and lead near it and a pearl fishery in the river Argun. It is 70 miles southeast of Nershinsk. So this is Nershinsk. It's a very famous and important city to do with its history, by the way, because um, you might have seen before about a treaty. Well, there's been a few treaties, actually, but this treaty... Um, we're talking about 1689. It was signed between the Russians and the Chinese, or the Tartarians, and it basically ceded a load of Siberia slash Manchu land back to China, and it was called the Treaty of Nipchu or the Treaty of Nerchins. So that's that's a story for another day. If you want to hear more about that, go watch the Tartarian, the new series. But the most important thing is that that, that document said that this was located about 70 miles southeast of Nerchinsk. Okay, Argon Skoy is somewhere around here. It's about 70 miles. Okay, so that works. But what was very strange was they said on the frontiers of eastern Turkey. Just have a look. A town of Siberia on the frontiers of eastern Turkey. In case anybody, you know, needs a quick refresher on where Turkey is, it's right here. So eastern Turkey is quite a bit of a jump from Siberia. So perhaps what they meant is Eastern Turkestan, which is what they named these areas of independent Tartary when they took over them. And we can actually see the location of East Turkestan is around here. Okay? So where where are we? We are up here. Okay, so it is technically on the frontiers of Eastern Turkestan. But it's still been changed. And just for reference, this book is called A General Gazetteer or Compendious Geographical Dictionary. Um, and it's written by Reverend Archibald Forbes, printed in London in 1815. Well, in 1850, we have essentially the same thing. But if we come down to Argon, a river of Asia, see Sigalian. Argunskoy, a town of Siberia on the frontiers of Chinese Tartary. There are mines of silver and lead near it, and a pearl fishery in the river Argun, on the west bank of which the town is situated. It is 70 miles southeast of Nurchinsk. Chinese Tartary. Eastern Turkey. Very strange, isn't it? I wonder why they'd do that. I mean, it's literally the same text. Argunskoy, a town of Siberia on the frontiers of Chinese Tartary. There are mines of silver and lead near it and a pearl fishery in the river Argon. It is 70 miles southeast of Nerchinsk. You know, it's a, a couple words different, but they've particularly changed Eastern Turkey and Chinese Tartary. Although this one is supposedly written first. So I don't know if this is a reprint in which they've changed it, because obviously 1815 is when the document itself was released. This could be a reprint. Anyway, back to our documents. So we think we might have located these areas because obviously it says that Unkan had this fight between Kurlon and Chula rivers. It calls these the Plains of Tenduk. It also says that Argon is in the same area or the people of Argon are this mixture between the Tendushans and the Mohammedans. And we also have Ergon, as in Ergon City, formerly Ergon Right Banner, a country level city in Hulunbur. Inner Mongolia containing the autonomous region's northernmost point. It is bounded to the north and west by the Argun River. So that is, again, most likely to be, because it it's on the same river, it's most likely to be the old Argun, possibly. Now, following in with the Ungs, we have this person who is called Togrul. Wang Khan or Ung Khan, don't laugh, come on, be mature. Um, but Ung Khan is supposedly Ung Khan. There is some differences though, however, this calls Ung Khan um, a friend or in the main source of the secret history of the Mongols, which is a book you should definitely read if you're interested in this stuff, describing a friend of Genghis Khan's father and he assists Genghis Khan and essentially gives him his empire. But there's no fight between them and he actually dies before Genghis Khan rises to his full power. But he was born on the Chul River, so is is the right place. But it seems to have some kind of confusion about who he really is, because as we saw, Un Khan supposedly had a fight with Genghis, gets killed on the battlefield, and then Genghis steals his daughter. Whereas this guy was friends with Genghis's father, and then he helped him. He was the blood brother of the Mongol chief Yezusi, and served as an important early patron and ally to his son Temujin, which is Genghis Khan. So he was an ally to Genghis Khan, where we obviously saw that's different. Now there's obviously connections from the Ung to the Ying, which is obviously the Yin. So there is possible a connection there where Ung is the Yin dynasty in China. There are also connections to Yongalism, 
which is the ancient Russian Younglist Church of the Orthodox Old Believers. So the Unglists, the Youngs, the Ungs. And following on with that, we've got the Unglings, which were a dynasty of kings, first in Sweden and later in Norway, primarily attested through the poem Junglingatal. The dynasty also appears as Scufflings. So oh, that looks very like Scythians, doesn't it? Scufflings. Um, in Beowulf. So once again, these are all the same people coming from the same areas. We've talked about how the tribes of Dan, the Danes, how they went up to the Scandinavian regions, rush around those areas. So it all makes sense, really. Are these youngs, the ings, the ungs, they're all the same. Back to finding Gog, which is ung. If we come to this old map, we can scroll down to here where we have Argon, this is in the region of China. Presumably this is the Amur River or somewhere close. And this bit here says... Once there was in Asia a Christian kingdom known to Prestigeon and D. Thomas founded it in this place so that it was in contact with the Church of Rome and was subjected to Rome through Prester John of Africa. And before we go looking at some more maps, because I thought you might like to see a few maps before we finalise this video with some conclusions on where uh, I think they might have ended up, because we still have some very interesting things to look at. So if you're watching, don't go anywhere. This thing... Ergenekon is, uh, Ergenekon is a founding myth of Turkish and Mongol people. The Turkish version. The myth aims to explain the foundations of the first Turkish Khaganate. The Ergenekon legend tells about a great crisis of the ancient Turks. Following a military defeat, the Turks took refuge in the legendary Ergenekon Valley, where they were trapped for four centuries. They were finally released when a blacksmith created a passage by melting the mountain, allowing the grey wolf Asina to lead them out. The people led out of the valley founded the Turkic Khaganate. Now, what does that sound like? Well, it sounds very like Alexander's story, doesn't it? Of locking the Gog and Magog tribes in a valley, a mountain valley, and tricking them and locking them in there by, by the gates, and they had to stay there for hundreds of years. That connection there, once again, Ergen, the Argon, Ergen people, it's all coming together. Another place that we need to mention, if, if you remember the Argon River on that document, it said Sea Sigalian, and on the Sigalian we have Hotun, or Hoton. So on the Sigalian is Hoton, and that is actually the ancient city of Aigun. Again, Argun, Aigun, on the Sigalian. This was, uh, it was a great city at one point, and it meant bright jade in the translation of Manchu, or Ducha. Now, we're going to come back to that. If you're keen eye, you might have already spotted it, but we're going to come back to that. So we'll just have a look at some maps. This is an old Arabic map, but we have the translation because up here is Magog and Jugog right there. So northeastern corner, if you think this is Europe, Africa, up towards the northeast. So you can kind of get a reference of whereabouts this should be. There's this map, which my friend has informed me. I've not had a chance to decode it myself and confirm, but he informs me that it describes Gog as a Jewish kingdom under a king called Atax or Artax, and Magog being a land of giants. And on the website here, it does say, and the future threat of the Gog and Magog, who are described specifically as Jews. And up here, we can see Gog and Magog in this little section. Again, this is south orientated upwards so this is the north so this is obviously northeast again this map provides us a view of the great wall of china down here here's korea avoid why it looks like it's an island they didn't know what they were talking about or maybe it was maybe the world's changed up here in the northeast again if you see the great wall here the northeast again is ung or gog and here is tenduk which was a Christian kingdom formed in 1290, supposedly. Although, it might be when it was formed as a Christian kingdom, because Genghis Khan is supposed to be in the early 1200s. He attacked, I think it's 1205? Or was it 1203? A little bit earlier? It was, either way, it's in the 1200s, maybe even a bit sooner. So, evidently, Tenduk must have existed for that to happen, but Gog, Tenduk, and Magog down here, otherwise known as Somungul, Sounds very Lord of the Rings, I know, but there we go. And this is interesting as well, because I don't know if uh, if it will be on one of the maps we look at today, but Barju has come up a few times, and on one of the maps, we'll see that Barju has it described that this is where the Treaty of Nipchu, or Nechinsk, that we talked about, was signed. We know where that is. It's at Nechinsk. So if Barju is Nechinsk, it gives us an idea of where Gog and Tenduk is, because Barju 
was essentially right next to Onochinsk, was only seven, uh, 70 miles northwest of Argon. This one looks the same, if not a little bit different, but up here is Ung Tendok, spot Tendok, but Tendok the city, Tendok the region, Ung Tendok, and Mongol. So Ung is Gog, Mongol is Magog, as we saw Marco Polo tell us. This map here doesn't have Gog and Magog by this point in 1700. It wasn't on the map anymore, but we do have Argonoi down here. And this does talk here about the Nipchu Treaty, but no, uh, unfortunately it's not the one with the Baju on it. But what I can do to back it up is look at the Baja Mongols, which obviously would be around the Baju region. So if we have a look right next to Lake Baikal is Baja. If we come back to our Google Earth map, we can see this is the lake, Lake Baikal. This is Nechinsk, where the treaty was signed that we'll talk about another day if you don't know about it. That was a peace treaty between the Muscovites and the Chinese and Tartarians. This region would be considered the Baja people, which is a big indication that when you see Baju on a map, even though it looks like it's right off on a coast, it would insinuate that the Baju people come from around here. It's also worth noting on this map here, the Baju Jin Tukum. And what that means, Bajujin Tukum, or Tokum, is the land's end, according to the 13th or 14th century's Mongol people's conception. So when you see it as Baju at land's end, that kind of makes a little bit more sense and might indicate, might indicate that what we're looking at here is actually Lake Baikal. So this area here, Bajujin Tukum, could be where they hypothesized at that time that the land actually ended or perhaps these people actually came from further north and this is just where they settled or maybe it's all a lie up to you to decide but the indication is that this area here corresponds to this area as seen on these maps which is usually to the west of Ung Tenduk and a bit north or west of Mongol and that they just didn't really know about all this extra land so with that in mind, we can look at Baju here and imagine that this is actually Lake Baikal somewhere here, possibly. And this Baju region, I mean, I might be completely wrong on this, but this is just what I'm working out. But this Baju region is just to the west of the region we're looking for, Tenduk Ung Argun, basically. And as you're about to see, if I rotate so we're actually facing north, East of the Baju people would be around here. So even though Argon River's here, we've got Igon over here somewhere, but we reckon around here. If you're Baju here, Ung, Tenduk, Gog, Magog, basically here. And now that'll bring us to the final piece of evidence. We'll look at a couple more maps and then I'll bring out the big guns. Another map here showing China down here. This one, Cathay. Sometimes you'll see people say that they were the same region, but they weren't. They technically were because they combined as an empire when the Qings took over the Chinese uh, Chinese dynasties in 1644. And obviously from that point on, they essentially were the same country because they were one empire. But up here, Gog, Magog again, and Baju up here. So when this, you know, this implies that we're well up into, into Russia, Siberia, and it very well could be. But some of the names would indicate that we are a lot more south than you'd believe. We can see again the Chinese wall down here. I noticed that that's very interesting. It's called the Otorokoromons. Otto, as in like Otto man. Very interesting. But up here, Mongol again, Ung, Tenduk, the Baju areas. Same thing in the northeast, north of the Wall of China. This map from 1760 gives us a view of Korea. It's a bit misshapen. But you can see Gog and Ung, I can't actually move the mouse because it moves the map with me, so that's annoying. But you can see Gog and Ung up here, just north of Korea. So Ung and Gog, which would indicate that it is in the Manchuria region. Another with the Wall of China, Cathay here, and Tenduk, Ung, and Mongol. As we know, Gog and Magog. And one final map here. I think it might be a, the same as the one we saw before, but once again, Ung Tenduk, Mongol, north of the wall of China, and seems to be following the coast around that area there, so Manchuria. And we're going to bring out the best evidence now, so if you stuck around, well done, this is how you learn things. 
But before we do, we're just going to have a look at this dictionary of holy words. So this is a dictionary of the Holy Bible, etc. by John Brown from 1819. And we're going to be having a look at the mention of Gog and Magog. Gog and Magog. Gog may signify the governor and Magog, when joined with it, may denote the people. Magog was the second son of Japheth and gave name to his seed. His posterity seemed to have people Tartary, a large country on the north of Asia and part of Europe, reaching in length from west to east about 5,000 miles. The ancient Tartars called themselves Mowgli or Magogli or Mongli or Mongongli, the children of Magog, which sounds a lot like the Mughal Empire. Oh, as I was about to say, the Tartar Empire in the East Indies is called the Mughal Empire and the country Mughalstan or the country of the Mughals. A tribe of eastern Tartars are still called Mongols or Mungals. Many names and places in Tartary retain vestiges of Gog and Magog. The Arabian geographer calls North Tartary, now Siberia, the land of Jiuj or Majiuj, and says it is separate or Juj and Majuj, and it is se- if he's Arabian, it will be Juj and Majuj, and he's separated by dreadful mountains from the rest of the world. We could go deeper into this book, actually, on another video, because there is another one I want to go through. So we'll do a, uh, a follow-up to this video. This is the main video, but we'll do a follow-up at some point, possibly tomorrow. But on to the final evidence. Earlier on, when we were looking at Igun or Argun, you might remember the Duchas that I said to keep an eye out for. The Duchas was the Russian name of the people operating the shores of the middle course of the Amur River, approximately from the mouth of the Zaya down to the mouth of the Asuri, and possibly even somewhat further downstream. Their ethnic identity is not known with certainty, but it is usually assumed that they were a Tungusic people related to the Jurchens and or the Nanai. The name of this ethnic group is sometimes also written in English as Ducha. Now, why would Ducha be interesting? Well, because the name of the area was supposedly Ten Dutch, the Ten Duchas. But if we want to confirm something like that, we're going to need a bit more evidence, aren't we? And if we read a teeny bit further down, We can see, according to the Russian explorers of the time, the Duchas, as well as the related groups, the Gogols, and their northwestern neighbours, the Dowers, were agriculturalists. The Gogols. That's very interesting. Unfortunately, they don't have their own Wikipedia page. But we can have a look at this map, which comes from this book, The Russians on the Amur. Unfortunately, this is facing the wrong way, but if you want to read this book, you can do. But we got the map here on Wikipedia, thankfully. Just take a moment to get yourself acclimated to where you are. This here is the Gulf of Tartary, Sakhalin over there. This is the Amur River coming down and back up. This is Argun with Argonskoy. There's Nochinsk, all these things we were seeing before, yeah? And we can see down here that this land is called Gaguli. Okay, this is Gaguli. And this is the lands of the Dowry, the Duchery, and the Gaguli. So, out two of three. We don't have Magog right here, but obviously it was a different region. It wasn't right next to it. But it did say the lands of Gog and Magog were around Tenduk. So we've got the Duchers and the Gogols when we wanted Tenduk and Gog, or Ung and Tenduk. So that's quite close, isn't it? You can see the Duchery, Akani, Gaguli. And this is exactly where we thought it'd be, in the northeast. So let's have a little bit more of a look at something. The Tartars claim to be of the lost tribes of Israel. And obviously we saw the documents claiming that Gog and Magog were Jewish. They come from the Jews. Well, technically, not all Israelites were Jews. That's obviously the whole tribes of Judah. But the notion that we've seen mentioned a lot is that they were survivors of Israel. They were part of the tribes of Israel that had been kicked out. Or the, the lost tribes that had gone walkabouts. I mean, they were never lost. They knew where they were. But they were lost to us. Is it possible that the Ten Duchas is from the Ten Tribes? The Ten Tribes, Ten Duchas? Because we're from the Ten Tribes? Is that a connection? Or is there something deeper than that? Because there is a religion that was followed by all these people right before Christianity and everything really stepped in, and that was called Tengrism an ethnic Turco-Mongolic religion originating in the Eurasian steppes based on shamanism and animism. It was the prevailing religion of the Turks, the Mongols, the Bulgars, the Xiongu, the Huns, and possibly the Hungarians, as well as you know, a load of others. And this was who that they were supporting. So is it possible that the Duchas were the ten Duchas? I mean, is it possible that the ten tribes of Israel were actually the ten tribes of Israel? 
the ones that followed the god Tengri, the sky god Tengri. As we can see here, we'll have a look at Tengri. But he's the all-encompassing god of heaven in the traditional Turco-Mongolian religious beliefs. He's not considered a deity in the usual sense, but a personification of the universe. So is it possible that the ten duchas, or ten duchas, were actually the duchas following Tengri? Well, possibly. But there is a teeny bit more evidence just to back this up, which I it blew my mind when I found this. And to find this little piece of evidence, we're going to have to come to the peoples of Central Asia and their tents. Why? Because the yurts were known for a particular type of tent that was used by all the different types of Turkish people, the Uzbeks, the Kurds, the Kazakhs, basically all the different Tatars. They used this very particular type of tent. And it's important because the roof wheel, called a tunduk, is freestanding and they can be either covered in felts, canvas and or reed screens. So the roof wheel is called a tunduk. Now that sounds a lot like tenduk, doesn't it? A lot like tenduk. Do you think that that might be connected? Now, I know you might be thinking, Luke, one's ten, one's ton. They're different. There is no way that ten and ton are related. They're different things. That's tunduk. This is tengrinism. There's, there's no similarity. So let's just have ourselves a little look at what a tunduk looks like. Okay, these, these are the tunducks. You see them? Look at that. Do you recognize that symbol? Well, you should do, because we just saw it. It's a symbol used by Tengrists, representing the structure of the universe, God Tengri, the roof opening of a yurt, and a shaman's drum. So, if you didn't think there was a connection before, you should be giving me a little round of applause right now, and saying, alright, fair enough, I was wrong. Because that is a tunduk. So, Tengrism literally used the symbol of their yurtish tents as one of their main symbols of the universe, and the God Tengri. So, do you think Tunduk and Tenduk are related now? Do you think that Tenduk must therefore be related to Tengrism? Has that made you think about whether or not the Ten Tribes of Israel might actually be related to Tengrism? There's a very big possibility there. Maybe they were kicked out because they followed the wrong god, Mr. Tengri. I don't know. Just some questions. I'm not making any claims. Just giving you the evidence and letting you work it out for yourself. But that, I think, is pretty concrete. That Tunduk is Tenduk is connected to Tengrism, which is connected to these Yurtish tents. So why would they call it Tunduk? Well, I'm guessing that the great Sham who lived there, the great king, as we know, the great Khan, who was definitely in Tunduk, as we just learned from all these books, he will have wanted the biggest tent, a giant royal tent. And in the middle of that tent would have been a gigantic Tunduk, because that's where they did their praying. That's how they connected to God, through the Tunduk, through the gateway to, to the sky. He would have had the biggest tunduk ever. Everyone around would have known about how big this tunduk was. It was impressive. And over time, the town would have been known as Tunduk. And that's, that's a possibility right there. So we've located Tunduk, Argon, all the areas that we, th well, we pretty much think we're there. Uh, we've got quite a lot of evidence to suggest they would have been in these regions. So we think we know where the story's talking about. We've also got things like Gagouli, which is, you know, that's quite evidence, isn't it? Um, and before we finally finish the video, just one more little thing to look at, which is the Korean element, and that is the Gagurio, uh, or the Goryeo, located in the northern and central parts of the Korean peninsula and the southern and central parts of northeast China. At the peak of its power, Gagurio controlled most of the peninsula, large parts of Manchuria, and parts of eastern Mongolia and inner Mongolia. So once again, another Gog, which was quite large. As you can see, Gagurio coming right up here past where Korea's usual boundaries are. So is this again connected to the Gaguli, who would have only just been here? The Gaguli would have been right up here. What do you think? Connected? You tell me in the comments below. So I've probably forgotten something, but I think that's everything to do with our journey in searching for the true location of Gog and Magog. And I think at least we have found what is, uh, at the very minimum, the remnants of the people that went by the name. We've seen a lot of descriptions, and I will come back with the next video to talk more about the two books that I was talking about, the one that we read a little bit from, the Holy Dictionary, and we've got another one that we can talk about as well. But they were too long to fit into this, and I'd already been jumping around so much, I've chatted for so long, and I just didn't have the time to add it in. But we'll do it next time. So if you did make it to the end, thank you very much. If you could drop a like and a comment, a few comments, that'd be great. You know, reply to other people's comments, all, all kinds of stuff. You know, do whatever, help boost the video. 
Thank you so much for watching, especially my supporters, Patreon people. You guys are the best. If you join the Patreon or the channel memberships, you will get access to my Discord server where you can come and talk to me and the other people in there. Uh, it's a fun way to do some research together. And, you know, just to clarify where we've been looking at, this region here is where we would have found our Goggins and down here possibly as well with our Gagurio. Where our Gaguli are definitely here. We found what's most likely to be Tendutch, the Duchas as well around here. There is also a great mountain pass right here, which could suggest that in fact they've come from further north. This could actually be the valley, because this is a bit of a valley here, a very big one, a massive valley, but it's very possible that they were living in this region here as Gog and Magog, and they've, they've moved out, and that's they have taken their names with them, which have followed down. So it is very possible that they were living here, and maybe Alexander had a gate here, maybe he was keeping them penned in for hundreds of years. Who knows? There are lots of possibilities. What we do know is that we found what Marco Polo was talking about, I'm pretty certain, based on the facts that they've given us, but we did see that they alter some of these books, like that one which they changed Chinese Tartary to East Turkey, for whatever reason. But yeah, I think around here, like that map showed, is going to be where you're going to find Tenduk, Argon, the Guguli people, maybe a bit further north. Because yeah, Yakuts is very connected to the yurts, and it's, it's very possible that they came from up here. I think one of my friends is trying to prove at the moment that this is the region known as Tartar, which would actually make it Magog. So that would mean this was Gog and this was Magog. So that's, again, a very big possibility. But thanks for watching. Do all the stuff I said, comments, likes. Cheers. Thank you. And I'll see you on the next video. Peace.